Okay. All right, I went ahead and started the recording and the live stream on YouTube. So good evening, everybody. Thank good you, evening, Juan, Juan, for your help. Thank you, Juan. My pleasure. Are you ready to go then? Are we ready to go? Yes, sir. All right, well then, uh, it's six o'clock and I will call this meeting of the Bend Historic Landmarks Commission to order. The first order of business then will be our roll call. Let's see who's here. Um, start off, let's see, commissioners. Jim, I see you're there. Present, David, yeah. I see you're there. Derek, Andy, here. you're there. Terry, you're there. Robin. I'm here. Andy, let's see. I don't think we're missing anybody. Heidi, um, did I miss anyone? Yeah, I think we got it, everyone. From staff, we have um, Heidi Kennedy and Ian Lighthouser um, here this evening as well. Okay, super. And joining us is Mayor Russell. Welcome, welcome to our little group here. Um, Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Um, <laughs> second order of business then will be general comments and questions from the public. Juan, is there anyone out there from the general public? I'm sorry, I was talking and I was muted. No, uh, Mr. Chair, we don't have anybody joining us at this time. Thank you. Okay, alrighty. So then there'll be no one, no one from the general public to give uh, comments or questions for the for the commission. Mayor Russell, would you like to um, make comments for us? Uh, I just wanted. Can you hear me yet? Yes, we can. Great. I thought I talk. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, drop by and say hello to everyone and thank you, especially for your service to our community. Um, all our committees and commissions on the city of End is, is a re really important bridge between our greater community and to our council and the policymakers for the city of End. So the work that you do um, is a really important role that, that we all value and, and all recognize. So first of all, I just wanna thank you. And I'm, I try to really jump in by the end as often, you know, certainly by the, hopefully by the end of the time I may or I'll have jumped into all the different committees and commissions several different times and just get to know you and understand your body of work. And, and also just look to understand how, um, if, how there could be ways for us to better, or, and as mayor and as staff to better support you in, the decision making and the work that you're doing. So I'm always looking for, you know, to see, see what you need, see what your needs are, see what the opportunities are so that you are as strong and as effective a body as possible um, serving our community members. And um, so that's really all I had to say tonight. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, again, I'll be sort of watching for a while as I'm working on a couple other projects <clears throat> and just getting to know you better. Um, I know you're all really bright and skilled, have great backgrounds. Um, you're relatively working together. Um, this is all sort of a recent experience. So you're still gelling and, and finding your middle ground and your paths. Um, and I know you have some pretty big projects in front of you that, um, that are also important to community. And um, you know, in the work that you do on the Historic Landmarks Commission, um, one of the priorities is, of course, infill and, and really making sure that we use the land inside our urban growth boundary as effectively for the needs that we have as a community as possible. And housing is certainly one of them. So to be sensitive um, to the values within a historic district, while accomplishing those overarching goals that are certainly true of this existing council as um, was also recognized in the urban growth boundary expansion discussions. Um, I know this is a balancing point that you're continuously working through. And so um, I understand that. And I know you recognize that too with your work. 
So with that, I'm just going to say thank you. I'll um, just disappear to the background here a little bit. And um, yeah, and always feel free to reach out to me with any questions as well. Okay. Again, thank you. Well, thank you for those words, Mary Russell. And thank you again thank for you. joining us tonight. Um, uh, I, one more, uh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. Uh, item three on the agenda, approval of minutes from February. I assume everyone's had a chance to take a look at the minutes. I am um, still working on them. It was such a I long meeting. It's been taking a while to do, so I did not get them finished for you, and I will have them, I promise, by next month. Okay, sounds good, Heidi. There you go. And we'll take a look at the, and deal with those then next month. Um, Heidi, that's going to bring us to um, the continuation from last month, PL 20-0713. Is uh, Mr. Oliphant? On the on the call on the Zoom, I do not see them. Um, he did provide me a additional email yesterday, so I was assuming he'd be here. So let me email him real quick and. Okay. Hey Jerry, could I ask a procedural question? Well, sure. Sure, uh, she's doing ahead. that. Yeah, yeah, um, and this may be uh, something for Ian if you don't know the answer. Um, since uh, Derek and um, Terry didn't participate last right. time, I know they can't, since they don't have all the information, they can't vote this time. Right. But, can, but can they participate in the discussion and ask questions? Uh, I can try to answer that. I mean, if, if you'd like. Um, and, and I actually may I may need to ask questions. So although Heidi did kindly send me the link to the, the hearing on this one, I was never able to open it. So I wasn't able to watch it. So Commissioner Vora, when you say um, people didn't participate, do we mean in the um, initial hearing on this application? Uh, yeah, in the past, what we've uh, done is if, if a, a particular hearing went on for more than one session is that if somebody didn't participate in the first session or even came in real late and didn't get all the information we uh said that you know they couldn't they couldn't vote uh so, what i wasn't clear on is whether they could still ask questions and participate right. in well good question so i can tell you that what what we often and, and that may be a custom of this body and and that's up to the body to form those customs, it's up to the chair really to make decisions on how a meeting is gonna happen. But what I can say is that with our city council, for example, when they are sitting in a quasi-judicial land use capacity, we have had cases where, for example, a council member had to miss um, an initial public hearing because of some other engagement. But if they watched the video and could say, look, I'm as up to speed on what happened as anybody who was there, they have been allowed to participate in deliberations that happened subsequently. So if if this body doesn't do it that way and says as a practice, you know, if you weren't here and, and weren't able to participate the first go around, you shouldn't participate in a continued hearing. I think that's up to the body and the chair specifically, but right. it's not necessarily a rule that it has to be that way because our city council, for example, will operate differently and allow okay. Of somebody, if they can, if they can certify that they've watched the video and are essentially as up to speed as they would be had they been there in person. Well, the video might be new with the Zoom. You know, prior to that, I don't know how you can correct me. I, I don't believe our meetings were recorded on video, but just just in note form. But yeah, now I don't know if we're going to keep going with Zoom once the pandemic ends or not. But um, we did an audio recording when we were at City Hall in the City Council chambers. But not well, Robin, one of the one of the things our our initial meeting, Commissioner Stevens did recuse himself. Mm -hmm. And and um, one of the things that we'll take a look at uh, right away is before we get started on the del deliberations of this uh, request is I'll find out if Commissioner Stevens is recusing himself again. Okay. We do have a quorum of commissioners. So I've, I count one, two, three, four, a uh, quorum of, of appointed commissioners. So then as far as voting goes, then we will not, um, 
need the votes of the alternates. Tonight. Right. Well, well, Stevens is not an not an alternate. No, I know he's not. But we okay. do have a quorum of commissioners, Robin. Now, yeah, no, as, I understand far, that. as far as input, the only one uh, Terry was not here, and I'll check with Terry. Uh, well, right now, did you did you uh, catch up with the um, uh, meeting last month? Um, because my first my first uh, um, thought would be to go ahead and take input uh, from Terry um, and any any insight that she may have. Okay. Yeah, uh, again, I, I it, wasn't able to watch the the video. I was going to read the meeting notes, but I know we're we're waiting on those. So I was planning just to you know sit this one out, listen in. Um, and since we have quorum, you don't need my my vote anyway. Okay. And then I'll participate in, in the rest of the agenda after this hearing's okay. over. So, the, so uh, Jerry, yeah. the, fir the first part of, part of my question for Ian was, can Terry and Derek still participate without voting? Yeah, um, so, yeah I, I can I can try to answer that. I mean, this this body is a little bit interesting in that I think as most of you probably know, the the code that sets out some of the the kind of rules of engagement provides that the alternates can participate in any deliberation mm -hmm. when they're not voting. So um, I'd say that's a can, and you know, an alternate who wants to participate should still be recognized by the chair, just like anybody else. But yeah, um, because alternates who who can't vote in a particular matter because they're not needed for the quorum, nevertheless can participate and deliberate. Um, you know. I think I, I I guess that same principle should apply to anyone else. I will say that if somebody recuses themselves from a proceeding for whatever reason, to me that means you're not just recusing yourself from voting. It means you're staying out of it, and you probably right. shouldn't participate right. or deliberate. Recusing means you're out. Um, so okay. and that and Robin, that's question. my that's my understanding as well. In our past okay. practice, has always been to let alternates um, uh, participate and have um, uh, input into discussions. All right, okay. that sounds good. I wanted to clarify that um, mm -hmm. before we got going. And and then a quorum for the, the vote is just three, is that correct? A, a quorum of the body is three, yes. Okay. Quorum, yeah. and, we have, and we have four, uh, we actually have all five commissioners here tonight. I'm trying, but Upkin's having difficulty getting in. I'm trying to get him in. Anyone right. else have, is anyone Sorry, else having uh, slight problems with the uh, audio kind of like time shifting on them? No, no, not yet. No problems. What, one more, one more piece of input. Sorry, I should have covered this, and maybe this is for you, Commissioner Vora. Um, the code is pretty specific. To defining what a quorum is, it provides that the commission may act by a majority of those voting while a quorum is present. So if you've got three, you've got a quorum, and mm -hmm. those three can carry any issue. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's my understanding too. So that in that case, the the alternate wouldn't vote if, if the alternate was the fourth or fifth person. Correct. Correct. Okay. Right. okay. Any any luck, Heidi? Well, so, uh, I mean, before we bring, <clears throat> before we move to the applicant, um, I would like to discuss uh, two things. Um, one, I, I don't believe in reviewing the January meeting minutes, which I was present for, that we elected the chair and vice chair as required by the Bend City Code. And uh, Andy, you're, Andy, you're absolutely correct on that. That is my bad, and that's on our agenda for tonight, yes. Is it, it's not on the agenda per se, Number right? Six. It's, yeah, it's on the agenda. Number six is election of chair and vice chair for 2021. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. And when we, when we finish with PL 20-0713, uh, we will review our uh, land use processes and procedures, and Ian's going to go ahead and lead us through that. 
And then the final thing tonight will be new chair and vice chair or okay. election yeah. chair and vice chair, however it turns out. Uh, okay. The second thing is um, at one point last month, I was uh, potentially casting tie breaking votes. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't see any, any, um, any, any provision that like an alternate commission would cast a tie breaking vote. So I, I, uh, I don't think we really moved on anything that has significance, but we'll refrain from uh, doing the, the kind of alternate breaks the tie. Um, right. I'm not the vice president after all. Um, no, that's yeah, right. And that's exactly right. You're, you're exactly right with that, uh, with that Andy and alternate only the, if it's a tie, um, uh, unlike baseball, tie does not go to, does not go to the runner. <laughs> a tied vote is a, um, is a failed vote. So if it does, if right. a vote that yes. they're not tied, then it's a failed vote. Yes. Yes. And according to Robertson, Robert's rules of order, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the third thing that I'd like to bring forward is, um, is the this difference between the experience I had as an applicant in mm -hmm. 2018 Mm -hmm. And my experience and the experience of the applicants, uh, we've really only had two applicants since, since I've been an alternate commissioner. Um, and those were both last month in the February mm -hmm. meeting. Mm -hmm. um, both of them were uh, basically recommended uh, by the committee to uh, have a continuation. So um, to, to basically withdraw for, for that uh, meeting and then come back at a later meeting. Uh, the applicant today um, is coming back. Uh, they, they didn't have a 30 day comment period, but the other applicant had a uh, basically a 30, another 30 day comment period, um, which uh, potentially delayed their project by 60 days, mm -hmm. um, which um, from the perspective of somebody who renovated a home uh, to live in themselves in the Bend Historic District in 2018. Uh, that would have been untenable um, for me and my budget to be uh, delayed 60 days. Um, at the time, there was there was two uh, there were two commissioners um, that are still on the the commissioner commission uh, commissioners Vora and and Sebastian. And uh, uh, the, the rest of the commission provided me as an applicant a uh, conditional approval, which still had some teeth to it and it had to be verified by planning mm -hmm. and um, even verified by uh, uh, the, the chair of the commission at the time, uh, Heidi Slaybaum. And uh, it did involve a window replacement of a similar size and scale to uh, these applicants or to this applicant. It also involved a, a, a major um, addition similar to the second applicant. Um, the fact that I got a conditional approval uh, at the time with a, a number of, several of conditions uh, meant that my project could move forward with only one appearance at the, at the commission rather than coming back um, 30 or, or 60 days later. So uh, as we consider applicants uh, moving forward, I would encourage the commission uh, to um, try to reach consensus to find a, uh, a conditional approval if it can be arrived at rather than, um, uh, than pushing uh, for more continuations or, or then rejecting applications if mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, um, that's my encouragement to the commission. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that input, Andy. Uh, Chair, David? Can I, can I uh, also address after uh, Commissioner uh, Coughlin? Sure, absolutely. So yeah. uh, thank you, because a, a lot of what I wanted to talk about today is actually summed up in, in those two applications uh, yesterday or last month. And I will tell you, as a builder, I tell everyone that comes on a job site, right, the most important word in the English language, which isn't please, and it's not thank you, and it's not you're welcome, right? It's today, right? In Spanish, it's hoy, 
<laughs> right? It, it, like you can translate the most important word in a construction uh, uh, arena down to one. It's today. What is getting done today? And for me, I just go apoplectic uh, when people want to delay, right? And not get to some form of yes, right? Just a little bit. And I've seen this consistently, right? Last month, last month we had, and Commissioner Coughlin, you can, you can, you'd be better uh, 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 versed at describing how good this architect is, right? But the applicant was an AIA fellow. Now I'm not an architect, but I just Googled what, what is an AIA fellow and they're in the top 2% of their field, right? That architect is also a chair on a landmarks committee in his California town. Now he's trying to come up here to bend. So he goes on and uh, uh, he hires a really good architect. Mr. Bunsen, I just wanted to let you know, we do have the applicant finally in attendance. So okay. we can go back Thank if you, you wanted to continue yep. this discussion we'll, we'll, till later. David, if you want to continue, let's, let's go ahead and get moving with um, with the application, he is on the the uh, the call now, Heidi. The applicant is with us now, Juan. Yep. Um, and can you also yes. um, leave a moment for Miss, uh, Mr. Lighthouser to, to talk as well, please? So oh, I'm I, I'm fine. I was just going to suggest that we move forward with the continued hearing before we go through any of that, but it sounds like okay. we're gonna do that. Yeah, and we now have the um, the uh, applicants in attendance. Okay, I think I would like to agree and let's move forward and deal with the application. Uh, this, is, this is the continuance from last month. Um, I believe that we can suspend with some of the, the, the formalities. Um, we're continuing a de novo hearing uh, of an initial initial evidentiary hearing from of PL 20-0713. Um, we've gone through all the hearing procedures. I think what we'll do is we'll have um, the applicant um, talk about the additional information that was added to the record. And we'll open it up for questions after that and discussion and then I'll go ahead and make a motion or not make a motion, but entertain motions. Just a moment. Um, there is, there was one place that I do want to um, go back into our, our script. Um, do any of the commissioners have any ex part contacts, prior hearing observations, biases or conflicts of interest to declare? If so, please state the nature and extent of those conflicts? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, uh, as a window contractor, as explained in the last uh, last meeting, um, having met on site, given the nature of the, the project, uh, I find it best to recuse myself from this, uh, this uh, case. Okay. And I thank you for, for that recusing of yourself, uh, Commissioner Stevens. Um, as far as a series of contacts amongst uh, the commission, um, uh, uh, Ian, we'll go ahead and talk about that a little bit later on our agenda. The other part of that is, does any party challenge Sorry. any commissioner based on ex part contacts, biases, or conflicts of interest? No challenge to any other commissioners. And if I can jump in for just a second, sorry to interrupt, um, but this probably is a good time at which to note, especially for the applicant, that there were some emails between uh, some of the Landmarks Commission members. Those have been, I understand, entered into the record. Um, so those are available mm -hmm. for anyone wants to see those. I don't think we need to go over them um, in any detail in the continued hearing, but just it's important to note that they exist and that they're in the record. And uh, I think that's probably enough for, for this particular issue until we get through this hearing. Okay, thank you. 
Um, yep, thank you. Still Just hearing? confirming then that since I wasn't here last month that I'm not gonna participate in the discussion or deliberation tonight. Okay, you're going to, um, um, now you, well, you won't need to recuse yourself because you don't have a conflict of interest, but you're going to sit this one out. Yep. Okay, thank you, Terry. Well, that still leaves us a quorum of appointed commissioners okay, to go ahead and pick up the rest of the continuation. Um, Mr. Noble, I'm assuming you're going to be speaking to the additional, um, unless, oh, Heidi, was there anything you wanted, uh, staff you wanted to put in first? Not at this point. Um, I did upload the uh, emails that were um, uh, emailed regarding this um, application and they are in the record, just like mm -hmm. Mr. Lighthouser has indicated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Noble, did you want to speak to the additional um, information that was added to the to the application? Yes, thank you. Um, we tried to get a, uh, a second opinion from, I believe it is Vintage Windows Restoration, a company that's done work in Bend, Oregon. They even show pictures that of work being done in the downtown area, I believe. I've emailed them several times as well as um, phone calls. I finally got somebody on the phone. We were, we were told that they're not even doing work here, but I could never really sort that out. When I finally got somebody on the phone, um, I was disconnected or hung up on and I could not get them again. And they didn't respond to the, the emails that I sent either. Um, getting a phone, getting a, a specific bid or a bid or a second opinion from a, an actual restoration company was trying at best. Um, so we uh, did a little research and I also know contractors in town and we came across uh, the one we did who also, they do restoration work to a degree, but there's no one in town that really specifically does it other than the commissioner, I believe is a specific window restorer. And um, these guys, uh, specifically Eric um, Hudson, he was, he's a finished carpenter, does restorative work in different capacities and is also was trained and worked with, I believe two of the founding members, a couple of the Landmarks Commission, I believe. So he is highly, um, on board with what can and can't be restored and the significance of you know restoring windows in central Oregon. And however, even he found stating that these windows to restore them, you would be rebuilding them. That he pretty much came across the same thing that we had stated. He walked the property, looked over everything, and basically it, he's not interested in the project. Um, we had him write that up. His contact info is in there. Um, he is more than happy to answer questions if need be. And that was, that was what we could find. Um, it's a very, it's a very trying thing to find somebody process mm -hmm. of windows. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for the additional. Um, are there, any questions for Mr. Noble from the commissioners? Yes. David, go ahead. So Mr. Noble, uh, and is Mr. Oliphant on the uh, uh, call as well? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Yeah, so I, see him, I see him show up, yeah. I've got a, I, I have a lot of questions, <laughs> right, uh, for, for both of you. and. I would say like m most lawyers, when they ask you a question, they know the answer to it, right? And, and I know the, most of the answers to these as well. Feel free, if you don't wanna answer any of these questions, just say, that, uh, just say that the application stands on its own merits, but I think that you will find it uh, uh, friendly overall to your cause, right? Mr. Palmer, uh, how many workers are gonna be on this job? It, it depends within the time frame in which we want to accomplish it. If we, we can throw everyone on it and we can accomplish it, if we have the capacity to finish it quicker than normal, but our crews are set up in two-man crews. 
Two men, and that's how we have things scheduled. Two men, how it, many days? It just depends. Probably how many windows are there? Nine windows. There's no paint involved. You're probably looking at four days, five days. All right. So eight man, eight man days is what this job is, right? Well, that's four or five days with two guys. So it's 16 hours. Right, no. 80, hours, 80 hours worth of work? Yes, thank okay. you. So uh, when did you first pick up this job? Um, I can't believe early fall <laughs> or so. Okay, and, and contact with the city right after that? Pretty much. Okay. <laughs> Six, six to seven months ago? Yes. Okay, so seven months to get, uh, seven months to get uh, two guys uh, for a week. Right, uh, um, you're certified as the, uh, by the state as a lead abatement contractor? Yes. Um, what fine amounts can be, uh, uh, what can you be levied with but from DEQ for lead abatement violations? I don't know the specific questions to, or the answer to that, but I know it's severe. I've heard, I've heard amounts as high as 13,000. They, they are significant if you do not follow their protocols to the letter. Right. So no matter what we say, right, DEQ has got a $13,000 stick that they can hit you with. Yeah. Right. So no yeah. matter what we say, whatever that inspector says, that's really the way that any contractor is going to get it done. Right. right. We just, yes. Right. So, uh, in your letter, uh, in your letter uh, from, sorry, the letter from uh, Eric Hudson, Hudson uh -huh. Quality Construction, he uses the word micronize in there. Yes. Item uh, three. Uh, yeah. Regarding lead. So, just to understand how small a micron is, that's one meter to the times 10 to the negative six, right? There are 1 million microns in a square millimeter. There are 1 trillion microns in a square meter. So the outside, the outside surface area that's painted on these windows, is that gonna be measured in, in meters? The outside surface area? Yeah, the outside surface. So you, you, you total up everything that's painted, right? You're gonna get a couple square meters out of that which means you're gonna have a couple trillion uh, uh, microns uh, of area, right? To deal with uh, uh, on your lead. That's just, uh, that's a yeah. stick, right? I, What's the fee that you paid to come before the commission? The amount? Um, it was significant. I can't remember the I dollar. Do you have the number off the top of your head? What the application fee is? Yes. I think it was in the $700 range. I also believe there's application fees before that as well that we paid. For what? Okay, well, I was just wondering. So, uh, So I heard uh, numbers last month um, thrown out there, and those are proprietary to you, so don't, don't repeat them, right? But just off the top of my head, $700, $700 is about 3% of the job cost here, right? Now, on a typical job, it's about half a percent, right, to 2% nationally. That would be the typical percentage of a permit on a job. And is that what you see? Like area. I'm sorry, you were cutting out on that last sentence. Mr. Palmer. Uh, so I was worried about that. All right, so $700 represents about 3% of your permit, which seems a little high, right, for, the, uh, for it. Is that typical for the, for the area? That is, the, dealing with the Landmarks Commission is significantly more um, expensive than any other permitting process. Right. So in other historic districts across the nation, Chicago being one of them, right, we have a lot of standards and permit or, or policies and procedures and protocols that we put into place here. And one of those is waiving permit fees in, in historic districts. So 
I just want you to, I want Mr. Uh, the commission to know that, right? That mm -hmm. the permit fee is a little, uh, is a little high because when I get to Mr. Oliphant in a minute here, right? He's got the, he's got the answers that uh, we're gonna be needing. So last question to you, Mr. Palmer, right? And please be honest. Uh, uh, have you ever heard the Landmarks Commission, the district or the area referred colloquially as the hysterical commission, the hysterical committee or the hysterical district? I have not, and I'm being honest, not heard it referred to in those terms, but I do know it's a, uh, more people will go around it than go through it in the industry, in the building industry. And that's evident in the homes surrounding Mr. Oliphant. Thank you, Mr. Palmer, because that, that's where I'm going. Uh, Mr. Oliphant, it was the same question to you. Have you ever heard Landmarks Commission District or the people inside of it referred to as the Hysterical Commission or the Hysterical District? Um, have I ever heard it? I don't know. Are you guys able to hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, 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 I missed the question again. I had a dial in on my phone. I'm sorry. Uh, no if I've ever no so the hysterical. Landmarks, Landmarks Commission right uh, uh, have you heard it being colloquially called a hysterical commission i had not because this was our first um she said hysterical the hysterical yeah i just i hadn't run into that because we just kind of got into this this um into this process um <laughs> we just got into this process so i had not i had not actually run into anyone who referred to it that way uh before okay but uh, All right. So, uh, Mr. Oliphant, the, the next question, uh, everything from here on is uh, for you. So at last month's meeting, you stated you were getting a permit because you wanted to do the correct thing, pay the fees, get the approvals necessary. And I appreciate right. you doing that, right? Because permits are one of the processes by which future in in investigations happen into past construction. Correct. For instance, we know the primary and secondary structure at 15 Northwest Franklin were built in, in, in 1941 because the permit was issued, right? So right. that's 142. So, and you stated uh, last month and Mr. Palmer uh, has confirmed that unpermitted construction, including the replacement of windows and siding was currently happening uh, in the district around your property. Oh, it's, it's happening within a couple hundred feet of my house. Yeah, there's. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and part, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Right. Uh, right. But part of that was that you were able to figure out that there were no permits pulled because you had right. found that out on the Bend website, right? Exactly. Yeah. And you're and you're familiar with navigating the Bend website? As as, as of as of a couple of weeks ago when we had our first meeting, yes, I've become yeah, pretty you, you uh, get good at it, right? Yeah. All right. So you were shown or sent links uh, to resources including the Bend website page. Uh, regarding landmarks, landmarks, a possible list of window contractors and restorers, <clears throat> and a pamphlet titled Historic Wood Windows, a tip sheet from the National Trust for Historic Preservation on the Restoration of Wood Windows. That right. part of the trust sustainability initiative. Is that correct? I believe that was in the last packet from the last meeting, yes. Yeah, did you read in that pa pamphlet where it states not every wood window can be repaired and there are situations where replacement is appropriate. <laughs> However, did. many historic wood windows can and should be repaired, especially if the windows were manufactured before 1940, right? Wood windows made before this time were constructed with individual parts, each of which itself is denser, higher quality, and then what is grown today, and generally more rot and warp, warp uh, resistant than modern wood. Now, right. Well, if not, I, I failed calculus, so I cannot claim to be a math expert. But 1941 and 42, that happened. That happened after 1940, correct? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So let's go back to the, let's go back to those situations, right? Uh, uh, not every wooden. Uh, there are situations where replacement is appropriate. Could one of those situations not described in that pamphlet? be having a house 50 feet from a highway? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of 
and, and a train. So, I mean, oh, would, um, uh, uh, that one's the next one, right? Could one of those situations uh, uh, be having a house 175 feet from a railway? Right. <clears throat> Could one of those situations uh, not described in that pamphlet be having a house 50 feet in front of a major thoroughfare on an incline so that you get to listen to every pickup truck owner with a supercharger on their right. diesel engine racing up that incline and then engine braking on the way down? Uh, yeah, we hear that all the time. Actually, you know, we're kind of right at Franklin, right at and Parkway, right? So we get we kind of get it from from two sides. Yeah, so uh, one of those situations uh, could be the, the window restoration letter uh, submitted uh, yesterday. Any, yes. one of the, any one of the reasons on that? And of course, the situation might be that you just don't want single, is he still there? I'm not sure if he yep. uh, I'm possible or not. Okay, yeah, I'm, I, can, I can hear you. Sure. Sorry, I'm on a- those, those ones might be just that you don't want single pane windows and the lead associated with it, right? And no, then you might, you just I, want I, nice it, in, in my In my heart, I want the, the building to last a long time and I wanna like have a, like be able to restore the, you know, to, to, to bring the windows up to date um, in a way that's that's in keeping with like, that's gonna last another hundred years. Like I don't want single pane windows in the house. Right. So uh, back to that list of window repair contractors. Was that sent oh, to you or was that on the website? What's that? The list of window repair contractors. I don't recall where I saw it. Um, I, Palmer and Palmer has done a lot of this work for me and helping me try to navigate this entire thing. Um, so I would have to ask him where he got some of the, the references from, and 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 we did, we did we did look locally as well. So, Mr. Palmer, was there a list sent to you of window contractors? Um, I can't, so to be honest, I can't remember if it was sent to me specifically. We are also working with or want uh, customers wanting to work with us that um, he has detailed um, emails from Heidi where Heidi did send him a list of contractors. The emails go back to, I believe, 2018 from a house he purchased and she, and I have those emails from a list of contractors that do restoration work, including the one I called uh, Vintage Restoration Windows, which none of them are in the Central Oregon area. So would, would Commissioner have Frenchman, can I, can, I, can I break in here for sure. just a minute? Commissioner Fergurski, would you? Yes, I'd just yeah. like a clarification as to what part of the hearing we're actually in. Is this the Leave presentation up. by the applicant? Or is this discussion between the commission, in which case uh, we should be discussing it rather than engaging in back and forth with the applicants at this point? Uh, it seems like we've gone into some hybrid here. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate Commissioner Function's questions. Uh, many of them are moot. Uh, you know, it, if he I'll, is I'll, I'll, wishing I'll, to make a, a motion so. regarding this, then we should be in the deliberation phase and the <clears> applicant <throat> should be allowed the chance to terminate their presentation at this point. The way okay. that I understood it, Mr. Chair, is that they didn't, uh, they left the presentation from last month and we are asking questions of the applicant. That was where we are and that's our usual procedure that commissioners have the right to ask applicants uh, questions, clarifying questions, um, just um, um, in, in, let's see. I, let me put it this way. We're not going to have another four hour Landmarks Commission meeting. So Commissioner Function, I'm asking you as a personal favor to me to go ahead and wrap this up so that we can I move on. Wrap to, I will wrap to, it up for you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, where, where, where are we? Mr. Uh, Oliphant, um, how did you find uh, Commissioner Stevens? Like, how did he end up on the list? He, he came through, I, I don't know if it was Heidi, somehow he got recommended to come out and inspect the building. Um, and that without like our like our approval i think it was just like hey we're gonna have someone come out to, to to look at the building 
Okay. So uh, watching your body language uh, uh, last month, at la last month's meeting, right? Yeah. When, uh, when things went sideways for you, um, <laughs> it looked like a it looked like a Labrador retriever, right? Came in yep. uh, uh, to the room. Oh, look! look. There he is. <laughs> right. Right. Like you were so mad that you can't, you couldn't even uh, uh, acknowledge a, 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 a black Labrador retriever. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah, that's correct. So, ha having gone through this permit process, and I'm wrapping it up, I promise to to please the do. Mayor. Having gone through this permit process, are you surprised there are other owners in the district that avoid the permit process? I, I don't. I'm not surprised at all. Um, right. I'm not, think, I'm not surprised at all. I'm if I wasn't, in, yeah. I'm interested in, do you believe that's because the process is too expensive? Yes or no? I think it's too expensive and too time. I mean, there's, there's also time expense. Like, uh, and, uh, so onerous and time consuming? It's been eight, it's been eight months. I mean, if there was, you know. So uh, are those owners, do you, in your opinion, are those owners making a financial calculation to pay a fine in order to save time? Probably. I mean, I think that makes sense to a lot of people. Um, it's, it's, you know, I think there's, and I've heard people say around the old, you know, I've been there, I've owned that building now for like six years. So I've had many people, heard many people say, I ask, it's easier to ask for forgiveness later than to ask for permission up front. Right. So do you, think, not, they would change, do you think that they would change their minds if the city used some best practices and waived fees on construction in historic districts. Like I think those other... are, I think those are questions that we need to take up either as a commission at another Mr. time perfect, or as a example of a discussion as to where to go from here. Um, Commissioner Function, I think you've made your point with I'm not your sure questions. That I have, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll yield back. Thank you very much, sir. Um, hopefully, uh, are there any other questions of the applicant? Mr. Lighthouse has a question. Mr. Lighthouse. Thanks. Um, not a question, just, just a comment. And, and it, to be clear, I'm not a member of the body. Um, the, chair needs, the chair needs to run the meeting and run the hearing. But I will say that there are a couple of problems with what I see as questions that don't go to approval criteria, the first of which is simple. Okay. Your, your decision has to be based on approval criteria and nothing else. It cannot be based on anything but the approval criteria. And those approval criteria are the universe of the factors that you are supposed to use in making a decision on any application. So when there are, and, and I have to qualify this, I'm not familiar with this application. As I mentioned, I didn't see the initial, didn't watch the initial hearing. My sense is that some of this, some of these questions and dialogue could not be related by any stretch to any of the applicable cr approval criteria. That presents a couple of problems. One, it introduces the impression that whatever the decision is, it was based at least in part on factors that this commission is not supposed to be considering in deciding this mm -hmm. app, whether they are a matter for discussion they see, but not in deciding a particular application. The second question, the second issue is, if there is a lot of time spent on questions, answers, and dialogue that do not relate to any approval criteria, it's insulting for staff, for the applicant, and for the rest of the commission to have to spend the time to listen to it. So I would advise everybody to focus on approval criteria in your discussions with each other and your questions of the applicant. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, no other questions for the I, applicant? Yeah, I have a, I, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Commissioner Gora. Okay, okay, I'll go first. Okay. Uh, two clarification questions for the applicant. Um, I wasn't clear on whether the applicant had a list of, of uh, I don't know if certified is the right word, but qualified. Um, uh, window restoration people that you contacted and why uh, did you apparently only contacted one? I know, for example, I'm trying to get work done in my house and I called several to get bids. Um, maybe I, I'll ask that one first. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let I'm gonna let Palmer answer that because he did reach out to several people. 
Yeah, well, first and foremost, we know the cost associated with these companies that were outside the area. The first one that we went with was obviously a company that had done work here in Bend, Oregon, and advertises that um, on their uh, website. And is um, also, with doing that, is one of the first ones that's, uh, that it is kind of suggested. Um, and this is where it gets weird is, one of our other clients is now being told that you guys cannot suggest companies or contractors um, to uh, people uh, obtaining or seeking approval from the Landmarks Commission. So it's, it gets really weird, but I did try that route and I know, but I know the expense of it of being in the industry. This is already expensive. I have probably a minimum of 60 hours into this alone, probably more like a hundred so far. And that goes to the first commissioner's um, statement about the time and expense of seeking out to do things the correct way to get a blatant no based on vagueness of the rules. Um, I did try to get a contractor and then mm -hmm. I tried to work within our own area for people who were brought up in restoration processes by people in the industry. And I found one specifically who was trained and worked with, I, I believe the, uh, a couple who were founding members of the Landmarks Commission. And I thought that that would be a great one. Okay. Robin, so did you have another question? Yeah, so you contacted a couple, it sounds like, one local and one somewhere else. I um, went outside the area first. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. And then this, uh, could you summarize again for us, since it's been a month, as to if if we did approval, did approve replacement, you know, with the double pane, the new narrow windows, as to how they would look from, uh, say, 20 feet away um, in terms of matching the original patterns and designs and, you know, and having a wood look versus some other kind of vinyl or some other kind of look. Uh, the win yes, I can. The windows are not vinyl. They're uh, an aluminum clad. They are the close, they're a very expensive window and they're designed specifically to mimic the look. So if you're sitting 25 feet away, I doubt you'll be able to notice the difference unless you have a trained eye. Okay. And uh, what about, I remember some discussion on, you know, the, the glass patterns and panes and things like that. Uh, wh where did you come to on that in terms of what, what you want to propose? The glass patterns? Oh, you mean the grids? The grids. I, 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 I'm, yeah, I'm trying to remember our discussion from last month on that. We will match everything exactly how it is. There was one window we wanted to mimic um, how it looks, and we still feel that that would be the best way. That's that front window. It's a, it's a uh, single unit now picture window with a... Uh, a storm window on the front that makes it look like a double casement window. Um, we wanted to replace it with a double casement window to mimic that look of the uh, the storm window on the out outside, but it we can mimic the exact picture window that's in there. Um, we can mimic the grid patterns exactly. Yeah, I think I think just I, I'm, I'm not I'm not the one like building the windows, but I think all the windows were actually to to it was like the, the intent was so that it looked exactly like how it was because we wanted to get approved um that that was we weren't trying to do some fancy new model windows it was literally the same grid patterns just more energy efficient better soundproofing um and from the street they're going to look exactly the same and they're constructed really well so the last another hundred years so that that was that was the intent that's why you know we didn't go to Lowe's and buy a bunch of cheap windows and put them in the building. Okay. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, and then this, this follows on to Commissioner Vora's questions. Um, I, in the previous meeting, I had, uh, we had discussed um, per the window inventory window one, which is the, um, the window that is original as a, picture window, a, a four wide, three high uh, a Munton picture window, uh, would you be amenable to um, replacing what is proposed as a double casement with a single picture window to match the 
um, a, original type, non-operable. Is it? We can do that, yes. Okay. The second question was window seven from your window inventory was a three wide, three high, uh, also a picture window. I believe the application proposes to replace it with a um, six over one uh, uh, vertical slider or double hung, I should say. Uh, would that, would it be um, acceptable for the project to, if it were a condition of approval to replace that with a picture window to match original? We can, yes, replace everything like for like, including operation. I think and we I'd discussed like um, that there was no egress requirements because uh, these are not bedroom windows um, and, and we didn't see any other code violation that, that those changes would um, potentially bring um, that would cause problems later. Yeah, you're correct. Um, can, uh, uh, Mr. Noble, can you can you just describe to us what a sing, what these um, applications have? They say SDL. Can you explain to us what a simulated divided light is and how it differs from other other um, options? Simulated uh, divided light is the grid that you see on the outside that gives it the appearance of individual panes. So it's one unit with the grid patterns on the outside. That's a larger unit that allows for more of, an, uh, of the inert gases being inside, which is a better insulative quality. So they put those subdivided light, put those on the outside a lot of times just to simulate the grid patterns. So it's a single pane of glass yes. and uh, there is a grid, but there is a raised edge similar to the, the um, historic condition. It's not like some of these that where you could run your hand over it and it would just be flat because it's just no, it's a an very image inside. So you're actually proposing a raised, it's raised on both sides. Is yes, that correct? Exactly. It's, it, it's got a, a detail to it. It's not a cheap flat grid that's just put on the outside. These windows are often used in historic districts through um, out the United States and it, it's a higher end window that they build to mimic the look of old wood windows. Okay, thank you. I don't have any more questions. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, is there any, uh, are, are there any other, anyone else out there to speak in favor? Mr. Lighthouser has his, his hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Lighthouser. Sorry, that's me neglecting to put it down. I will do so now. Oh, okay. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So then, last time we we met, there was one opponent of the project. Do we have anyone else on the conference that wishes to speak against this project? Okay. Then, hearing none, we will go ahead and close the input part. And we have had um, quite a bit of discussion already on this on this um, uh, project. Is there anyone who would like to put in a in a, in discussion form uh, anything additional or new that we haven't already covered? <laughs> I guess one. No. Okay, then we will go ahead and we will move on to, um, Heidi, do you have anything else? Uh, I have a question for you. You had a, um, in, a, in the year staff recommendation last time that we looked at, there was something about the casings and I don't have those notes here in front of me as a condition that would be to, to um, accept or have, have different kinds of casings put around the windows, if I remember right. Um, just what Commissioner Coughlin was talking about, just you know, matching the windows mm -hmm. in the design. That okay. was, he covered it. Well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Then I will entertain a motion, Commissioner. Well, first I'd like to ask, could I ask Heidi a clarification question? Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. And I don't know if we're going to have any comment after that before the motion, but uh, Heidi, did you? Was the applicant provided a list of Oregon um, 
you know, qualified contractors for these windows. Did you provide one or did the applicant have to get one himself? Um, Mr. Noble and I have worked on a couple of projects and, you know, as a staff planner, I have uh, an email with a group of um, lists from the state of Oregon and uh, window uh, people from Oregon that I hand out on a regular basis, email on a regular basis. I have never included Mr. Stevens on any of those emails with, I've, you know, these, these are links to different organizations, the State Historical, Pres State Historical Preservation Office has a list and so I've been using those. Um, Mr. Noble and I have worked on a couple of projects. We probably uh, gone back and forth with that list before is my guess. Okay. So not specifically for this project, but your assumption was that Mr. Noble had a list. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Jim. Yeah, uh, I just want to clarify uh, with staff, Heidi, in the original application, the applicant had presented several different, you know, a, a different type of window trim based on surrounding buildings. And in your staff report, the ending uh, paragraph states that in, in the event of an approval that you, rec you were recommending that the alternate window trim be approved <coughs> as well. Oh yeah, what they were proposing, correct. Yeah, yes, I'm sorry, I misunderstood the last question. I was thinking it was the design of the windows, not actually the trim that was around yeah. there. Yeah, I just yeah, I'm sorry. To clarify that because it, it, it was Thank you so much. different, but it was- I misunderstood. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Then I will entertain- or I would, I, I, I would um, recommend, yeah. I won't be voting um, since we have a quorum, but I would, uh, g given the, the front door of, or the front of this um, building has fairly limited view, but um, I do think that a, a casement window, a double casement window with a center style um, does have a significantly different appearance than a picture window that uh, even if they still had the same number of panels mm -hmm. and, um, as I had discussed with Windows 1 and Windows 7, uh, using the, the um, terminology from the window uh, inventory, um, I would recommend uh, that a, uh, a conditional, um, if an approval were granted, that it would be conditional upon um, matching the picture window style of Window uh, 1 and Window 7 with the same number of lights. Okay. All righty. Do is there a motion? Does there a well, motion? Well, well, Jerry, have you closed the the public portion yet? And yes. would there be an opportunity am I, for? Am I, am I still on? Am I still on? By any chance? I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I. I like. I would personally. I, I'll pay. Like, if it's it's not a matter of money. Like, if there's like, oh, we'll approve it if you do these types of whatever. Like, it doesn't like. I would totally do it. So I'm not trying to fight anything on like price or anything like that. I just want I, to make that clear that there's no, if, if there's, that, like, if, yeah. Mr. Oliphant, I heard that earlier. When, okay, uh, cool. I just wanted to make sure. Andy, yeah. Andy, okay. I appreciate okay. everyone's time. So thank you. Yes, we're, we are finished with the public input. Uh, questions have been made. Um, uh, discussion has been done. And um, this I, time, I, I, is there a motion? Well, I, I, I still kind of have a general comment. I don't know what port, mm -hmm. where to put that in there. I mean, this is just to the other commissioners. To the other commissioners. Yeah, I mean, you close the public hearing. This is just for our discussion before we vote. The, well, um, I don't have a motion yet. Oh, okay. Well, can I go ahead Wait. and just have a general uh, statement? Because you were yeah. asking for a motion <clears throat> or before that. I a motion. I call for a motion. Okay. We can. You can make your comment as part of the discussion for the motion. For okay. Motion. <clears throat> Is there anybody who wishes to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Uh, motion is to approve the windows. Uh, the application. Motion is to approve the application, as is, 
with the exception of replacing windows one and seven, like for like on the light, L-I-T-E uh, count. Okay, Commissioner Function has made a motion to approve the application with the conditions of the replacements of windows number one and seven as like for like with uh, with the uh, uh, light count so window one will be a picture window picture uh, window and window seven will be a seven picture. or window seven will have uh, uh, the existing light count uh, as as is or as is now clarification okay, of the motion if i may uh would like is Commissioner Function, is it your intention that that when you say like, you know, the application as presented to include the alternative window trim presented as well? Yeah, okay, let's, let's add, yeah, let's add, uh, let's add that. So motion restated would be to approve, uh, to approve as drawn with the exception of window one being a picture window Window mm -hmm. seven being having the same light L-I-T-E count uh, as it does now. And with uh, the alternative trim as described at this meeting. Actually it's described in the application. It's described it's in the application. application. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? I am not seeing a second to the motion. Once, twice, three times, the uh, motion fails for lack of a second. Is there anyone else who would like to make a motion? Is there a, a motion to? Sure. Mr. Chair, is it, if nothing happens here, what happens? <clears throat> well, if nothing, if nothing happens, if there's no motion to approve with conditions, without conditions or whatever happens to be, then the application fails for a lack of a motion to approve. Well, seeing as how uh, uh, we got into this uh, uh, with Commissioner Vora and Commissioner Figurski, why don't you uh, uh, at least put forth a motion of something? So uh, let me offer a suggestion. Um, I didn't read the staff recommendation, but I believe it was for approval. And so no, it wasn't. A stand it was not for approval, sorry, okay. No, no. It was not for approval. And that, that, makes it, that makes it more difficult then. Um, Heidi, what was the staff recommendation? Staff recommendation was um, that they uh, provide a second opinion on the viability of saving the windows and restoring them versus replacement. Mm -hmm. So um, without a second opinion, I was unable to recommend approval. And I suggested in the event the commission approves the replacement windows, that staff recommends that the proposed new trim design be approved as well. And with regards to the new trim design proposal due to the several examples that they provided in the um, application materials, uh, I was able to support the new window trim. And, and that's, that was my recommendation. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So the recommendation opinion. is to approve now? The recommendation? No, staff recommendation. No, we do not have a new staff recommendation for tonight's meeting, if I No, this was from last month. From last month. Correct. But now but now they have put in the second uh, second letter. So has the Correct. staff recommendation. I'm not sure. Well, they provided the, the, the letter last night. So right. um, 
this is up to the commission to commission. review that and and take that into consideration. And, and I think what what Mr. the commission what Mr. the commission Mr. might want to consider is whether whether they feel the applicant has sort of cleared the hurdle that Heidi set in her recommendation, and if a member of the commission thinks the applicant has done that, they might consider moving to approve based on the staff condition being met. Uh, Jim. Yeah, Jerry, I mean, yeah, that was the point that I was mulling over uh, mm -hmm. regarding this application. Since applications have to be approved based on findings of fact within the application itself and yep. the, uh, the applicable criteria, uh, and one of the things that was missing at the last hearing an application was that second opinion. Yes. Uh, so I would agree or I would move to approve the application, uh, modifying the proposal for Windows 1 and 7 to be like for like with existing and approve the new, uh, the trim that was proposed within the application uh, based on the fact that we now have a letter in the application file uh, supporting uh, replacement rather than restoration. Okay, so now, all right, we have a motion on the floor. Let me just get this straight. A motion on the floor to approve the application, windows numbers one and seven to be modified to be picture windows. Uh, like for like. One and seven, like for like. Yeah. And then to, uh, and as a condition of approval, and another condition of approval would be the trim around the exteriors of the window. Did I get that right, Jim? Uh, I don't, uh, <laughs> yeah, basically, I, I don't know that the trim is a condition of approval since it was part of the application and we were approving the application with the only two exceptions being the changes to windows one and seven. So I don't think the trim, the trim is part of the application that was submitted and mm -hmm. we're including that in the approval of the application. Okay, got that. All right. Do I hear a second? Second. This motion? Okay. Discussion of the motion to approve. Yeah, it would just be to, uh, this would be the place maybe to express my comment. Yeah, it's gonna be the place, Robin. Okay, I, I'm, I guess I'm torn on this one. Uh, I mean, I'm sympathetic to the applicant. To me personally, how something looks from, you know, 20 feet away is what's, you know, probably more important to the public at large. Um, and it appears the applicant is make, willing to put in higher grade, you know, moder modern but higher grade windows that would, you know, not look overly modern. Um, but, the, but the code does say to the extent practical Original architectural elements and materials shall be preserved. You know, materials used to uh, retain original materials to the most practical mm -hmm. extent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our job is to, as Ian said, is to implement the code. So there's a problem there. Uh, so kind of the workaround on that in the past has been, well, to get a second opinion that you can't restore, uh, you know, what's there now. And I think you know the applicant really made one apparently one call to somebody who's who was probably likely qualified, um, and I think the applicant could have made more calls uh, if there was a list. And <clears throat> the person that he used for that second opinion was a contractor that didn't necessarily work on historical buildings. Um, for example, when I go to the CCB, the contractor website. It shows that he's not approved to work on any anything with lead paint, but meaning any structure before 1978 or 76, something like that. So he obviously, <clears throat> at least uh, legally, is not is not allowed to do that, and you know I would guess doesn't have the experience with that. Um, I guess as a compromise, I, I would consider going along with this, but I would want the commission in the next month you know, next meeting or the meeting after to really clarify 
uh, what that code says and if we wanna change that code and propose a code change to the city council. And second, really um, outline a, a good procedure on what a second opinion, what constitutes a second opinion. And because this is gonna come up again, this is not the first time. No. And <clears throat> I think if, if, you know, I, I guess I would encourage, I mean, I hope the rest of the commissioners would be agreeable to that, that we had a work session on those two points as part of one of our next two meetings to avoid what is, you know, what has happened here. I would agree to that. And I think that we need to expand uh, uh, work meetings <clears throat> across the board and bring it on. So. Okay. Those are, those would be considerations and agenda items for a work session in the future. Well, right any now, Mr. Group? Mr. Oliphant is here and those dogs will have to be walked at some point in time. Any, uh, is there any other discussion of the motion? Then all of those in favor of the motion signify by raising up your hand in the screen. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimous. Heidi, did you get, you have all the, the other, the, the yep. uh, um, details of the motion itself? Um, I would certainly hope that the alterations of uh, windows numbers one and seven that would um, they would work with you to make sure that those alterations match the intent of the commission yes thank you everybody thank you thank you all thank you um that's almost like anticlimactic gang okay? um <laughs> are you are you're all able to hear me Yes. Yes. Scott. I just want to thank you again for your time. I know it's a complicated situation and I just wanted to thank you again. So I, you know, it's been, it's been a process. So thank oh, you. Uh, I've learned a lot about, you know, just like working with the historical district and I look forward to owning the building for a long time. I know with these new windows, uh, the building is going to last a long time. So I, a lot longer. <laughs> I appreciated the thoughtful questions. A thank ton. you. The okay, questions. Thank Thoughtful. We appreciate thank it. We'll, we'll let, we'll let so you move much. on. I know you're trying to keep this one shorter. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. That does move us on to item number five, review of land use processes and procedures. Ian, you're on. Thank you. Um, I think, so at the city, we spend most of our time using Microsoft Teams for our meetings, at least I do. So whenever I'm on Zoom, I'm a little bit out of my depth. And so because of that, I've asked Heidi to kind of drive the presentation. Um, interestingly, yes, I have a PowerPoint to go through. Um, we actually just had a lot of internal discussion today about using PowerPoints less often because I think we're overwhelming people with them, but we are gonna use it tonight. Uh, I'm gonna try to move through it. Uh, there are only 13 slides and I'm probably only gonna really talk about half of them. So hopefully Heidi is able to put it up there and share it. And once, once we have that, or once I think we have that, we can get started. And, and while we're getting that ready, I think, I think we did this, um, I, I wanna say maybe not, not that, it was pre-pandemic, but maybe not that long before. Um, January, 2020. Okay. January. 2020. Mm -hmm. All right. So you do remember. So a little over a year ago. So we've done this, but um, we thought we'd do a little bit of a refresher, mainly on um, kind of how we go through quasi judicial processes. Okay. I'm going to so, try this. Okay. And, and, and just for warning, I'm going to try to keep this short. I, I may use some examples from from this application now that it's done. Um, and, but I'm gonna qualify this. I, again, I didn't see the first hearing, so I'm gonna maybe touch on a few things that I, that I saw and heard, but. Um, can it, you see, can you see it? Not yet, it doesn't look like it. No. Here we go. Got it now. Okay. 
Okay, let's move to the second slide and uh, we're gonna roll through these pretty quickly. Um, hold on, hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> I got three screens up, I gotta try to figure oh, out where I'm. Sorry. Okay, I'm ready. All right, let's go to the, the second slide, which is just still an overview. Um, when a decision-making body is is doing land use in Oregon, it's 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 doing one of two things. It's sitting in a legislative capacity or it's sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity. And um, this body doesn't really do uh, legislative work, but you know when you are doing what you did tonight, which was sitting as a quasi-judicial decision-making body, you are the judge. You are the judges. Um, you are. You know, you're sort of a five-headed judge um, making a decision. And what judges have to do is they have to apply the law. Um, good judges apply the law. They're supposed to apply the law. But when we're talking about quasi-judicial decisions in a land use context, you are really, really, really supposed to apply the law. And if you don't and introduce things that aren't the law, which I'm also going to say are the criteria, um, they, are, they are one and the same in land use. If you don't apply the criteria, that is the law that you are supposed to apply, you are going to get eventually, not automatically, but you are eventually going to get appealed and Luba or somebody is going to reverse your decision. So you really have to apply the law. The reason, the reason that's important to me, and this is editorializing a little bit, is because when we have a code, um, which is never perfect, some people think it will do too much, some people will think it doesn't do enough, but when we have a code with approval criteria, we've got rules of the game for applicants, for developers, for people who like a project and people who don't like a project and everybody in between. So the reason we have to stick to the criteria and only the criteria is because frankly, that's the only fair way to make decisions in a land use context so that everybody knows how the decisions are going to be made. So that's editorializing, it's maybe even moralizing a little bit, but I, I do really believe that that's why this is so important that you stick to the criteria in making this decisions. It's these decisions, it's so everybody who's interested from the applicant to a neighbor, to somebody that has an interest in historic preservation knows what the rules of engagement are gonna be, what the, the rules of the game are. Um, if we introduce other things, to me, it's, it's frankly just not fair. So um, you can always lobby to change the system. You can, you can lobby for the legislators, in this case, planning commission and city council to change the law if you think the criteria don't work. But um, by being on this commission, you are, you are affirming that you are willing to apply the applicable criteria. And if you can't do that, this probably mm -hmm. isn't the volunteer gig for you. So let's move to the next slide. Um, and then I'm gonna move through a couple pretty quickly. Uh, the next one is just sort of an overview of how the legislative land use process works. Um, all you really need to know about that, and I think you alluded to this earlier in one of the commissioner's comments about maybe getting some of the code changed. Yes, it's the planning commission and the council that does that. So like any legislative body or any legislator, they are lobbied from all sides at all times by people who have ideas about how to change things. So that's that's how things change, that, that's fine. Uh, next slide, and we're gonna really get into the, the, the meat of quasi-judicial work. So there are really two types of quasi-judicial decisions that this body deals with. There are listing and, and delisting decisions, and then there are construction and alteration applications, which is what we did tonight. So let's move on to the next slide. And there we can um, address a little bit what, um, what you're supposed to be doing. And, and I've, I've touched on some of this. What you, you really need to do is focus on the applicable code provisions. And, and I'm, not, I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to pick on you, Commissioner Function, but the question- All right, go ahead. And, and, and it's, I'm really not, but some of the questions tonight seem to me like they were more uh, questions of the applicant, were more about, you know, the system in general, um, whether an applicant, whether a property owner should have to jump through these hoops, whether it was efficient to jump through these hoops, whether it was you know, reasonable to pay X amount of dollars to get this approval. I totally understand that people have different views of, again, whether standards 
are too restrictive, not restrictive enough, too burdensome, too time consuming, too expensive, totally get it. But in my view, those questions weren't really pertinent to this application and, and they didn't really go to any of the approval, any of the approval criteria. And where, where, I, where I think you run the risk in going down those paths in a quasi-judicial capacity is you, you know, you, my sense is you wanted this commissioner function, you wanted this thing approved, right? You wanted this approved with sort of as expediently as possible with as, you know, maybe as few conditions as possible, but by introducing commentary questions and, and content that don't really go to the approval criteria, you're making your decision more vulnerable on appeal. And, and here we didn't really have anybody that I could tell who was against the project. The people weren't coming out of the woodwork to oppose it. But when you introduce all of these other elements into your decision-making process, you, you provide opportunities for people to question whether your decision was really based on the approval criteria. And if it wasn't, if it is appealed, it is going to get reversed or remanded. And that's not really what any decision maker wants. I mean, they want their decisions. Judges, they don't like they don't like getting reversed on appeal. They like their decisions to be clean and solid. So I would encourage all of you to focus on the approval criteria when you're asking questions. If you don't like the system or don't like the rules, you know, then you advocate to the legislators to to change or adjust them. That's probably something that I think the Planning Commission and Council want to hear from this body. You are steeped in the Historic Preservation Code. Council isn't, Planning Commission isn't. You know, they do, I think, want input when the opportunity is there from the experts who are living with it every day or every month uh, on how it's working. So not saying that these are the rules and you have to play by them. I'm just saying if you don't like them, try to get them changed in the right way. Don't don't trash them or try to change them in the context of a particular application. I don't think that's good for the applicant. Um, I don't think that's good for anybody. Okay, off my, off my high horse. Um, we do have some time limits. We've got to make quasi-judicial decisions within 120 days from the date the application is deemed complete. Um, sometimes that takes a while. Uh, and you've got to move through this pretty quickly because you've got to allow time for an appeal to council. I know that doesn't happen very often with this commission, but it's more of a concern with the planning commission. Okay, let's move to the next slide if we could. All right, so you work through this a little bit. Um, you've really got three options. You can approve an application, you can approve it with conditions, that's probably the most common, or you can just outright deny it. Um, conditions are pretty common. Um, the next slide I think will cover some of the conditions a little bit. Um, if we can move to the next slide, it, it'll, I think there's some, discussion about exactly what conditions can and can't do. Um, we'll get to that in a minute, I guess, because it's not the first thing on the list. So, so let's talk about deliberation. So we, you deliberated tonight um, once the applicant was done presenting and answering questions. Um, you've heard me say more than once that deliberation really should be focused on approval standards and criteria. Um, you've also heard me say that you really should only deny something because you think it fails to meet a particular applicable standard or criterion. And you know, this is probably worth saying, if you are going to vote on any application, if any one of you is gonna to vote to deny an application, you had better be able to point to the particular criterion that you think is not being met. I mean, that helps your discussion with the other commissioners and it's just really a foundational piece of a defensible decision. Uh, in terms of conditions, because it's very common to impose conditions, you cannot necessarily make up anything you want as a condition. Just because it seems like something that makes sense or, or um, appeals to you or seems reasonable doesn't necessarily mean it's a condition that we can support and defend. A condition that assures compliance with a code standard is almost always going to be okay. Um, and any condition that you're thinking about has to be something that is feasible. It has to be something the applicant can really do. You know, this is a, a farcical example, but if you set a condition that the applicant has to, you know, win the lottery next week, that's not gonna work, right? Um, if you set a condition that the applicant has to do something that is essentially outside of the applicant's control, it's probably not going to be a justifiable condition. It has to be something they can actually so this does come up fairly frequently and you can get pretty creative 
in thinking about conditions, but it really has to be something the applicant can actually do. Um, back in a couple of these last bullet points on this page to sort of the guardrails, the sideboards that you're operating within, if an application meets all of the standards and criteria that apply, you have to approve it. Um, you know, if, again, my point earlier, if you're not approving something or voting not to approve it, you need to be able to say it's because this particular criterion wasn't met. Now, um, in some land use contexts and some land use applications, there aren't any discretionary criteria. In fact, in some, some development applications, it's illegal to have discretionary criteria um, for needed housing, for one. That is not the case here. There are quite a few subjective or discretionary elements in the approval criteria here. So mm -hmm. those of you who want to push on the system a little bit and bring in your, you know, your lens, your take, that is the place to do it, right? Because you have some subjective standards and some of the approval criteria that are, they're open to maybe sometimes interpretation or maybe sometimes a range of ways to apply them. So to the extent that there are commission members that see things differently or have some, I'll say, intention on how some applications to go, should go, look for, the, look for the subjective criteria that are at play in any given application and work with those because those are, are Frankly, they're great places to disagree and have some of those discussions with each other. So please do that. I think that's part of what you're supposed to do, but it really should be based on the criteria that apply. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is something that I think is probably also worth talking about. I, I think I sent an email a couple of weeks ago. I can barely remember it, um, but you know, there, this ID, the, these distinctions between ex parte contacts and some of our procedural requirements and standards I think can get a little bit nuanced. Um, I'm gonna to try to keep this simple. An ex parte contact is a contact outside of the hearing. So outside of the hearing, outside of the record with anybody who's interested in the outcome of a decision. That can be the applicant, that can be a neighbor who thinks the application is great, that can be a neighbor who thinks the application is terrible, that can be a contractor who's going to work on this project if the application is approved. Um, it's it's kind of it's kind of anybody who cares or has an interest. So, if any of you as decision makers have an ex parte contact with any interested party, all you really have to do is report them. You know, it's yes, they're discouraged. It's not true to say you can't have them. It's certainly not true to say that if one occurs or you have an ex parte contact, things are gonna blow up and everything's gonna be terrible. No, 99% of the time, that's not the case. You just have to report it at the outside of the hearing and say, you know, I was at, thinking of the before times, I was, I was in the bar at Deschutes and I ended up talking to this neighbor and we started talking about this application and she thinks it's terrible. Say that at the beginning of a hearing and then move on, not a big deal. Um, but I'm also going to talk about how deliberation needs to work. So to the extent you are talking about the application, um, it has to be in a public hearing. It really has to be in the public hearing. Um, shouldn't be to each other outside of a public hearing at the pub, if we ever do that again. It shouldn't be over email. It shouldn't be over the phone. It really should be in a public hearing. So to the extent you have thoughts on an application that come to you outside of a public hearing, make a note, save it, talk to staff. You can always talk to Heidi at any time. At no point will any of you run afoul of any ex parte issues if you run something by Heidi. You can have an extensive discussion with Heidi about an application really at any time that is never going to be ex parte contact. So I would encourage you to go there uh, if you have questions. Okay, let's move on to the next slide which I think covers meeting procedure. So here's another, here's another thing I noticed today. Um, and I don't think the mayor's on the phone anymore, but what, what Mayor Russell will often do, especially when she sees something coming that is going to be, uh, you know, not everything our city council does involves a lot of discussion. A lot of things are, there are some mechanical things that they do, but on big issues where they need to discuss some, sometimes land use issues, sometimes other things, what Sally will sometimes do is once the staff presentation happens, you know, once in this context, once the applicant is done, 
once the public hearing portion is closed, she might say, okay, everyone, I'm gonna go down the row, left to right, right to left, or top to bottom on the screen or whatever it is. Ask everybody to take two or three minutes to tell me what you think. Um, and, and, and maybe maybe they'll run through it that way and everybody will get a chance to talk before anybody gets a second chance to talk. So there are different ways to do that, um, but really none of you in my view should be trying to take the floor without being recognized by the chair. And that can be a little bit harder in a virtual setting because we're not looking at each other in the same way, but, but really there should be a system where everybody gets more or less an equal turn at the microphone. Not everybody wants to take that turn because they don't always have anything to say, but um, if you wait to be recognized before speaking, it just, in my experience, just helps the meeting run a little bit better and it creates space for everyone to, to have a minute if, if, if they want to take it. So um, that's, that's important. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about motions and seconds that you had an example of that tonight. There was a motion that didn't have a second and it died. Um, that was good. That went quite smoothly. Um, so I think you understand how that works. So, so uh, the next slide, which we can go to Heidi is about motions. I really don't think we need too much time on that. So, so let's, let's, let's go to slide 12, if you could, and then we can maybe wrap up and ask some questions or answer questions. So there we go. So deliberation, um, there are different ways to deliberate. And, and this was actually, this was illustrated tonight. Sometimes there's a question, should we talk about this first or should we get a motion on the floor? Different bodies do it different ways. It is not, I don't think it's particularly important um, which way you do it. I think having some consistency is important. Um, some bodies don't deliberate until a motion is introduced and then seconded, and then it's discussed, then it's deliberated, and then it's voted on. Um, there are cases where maybe no one is really sure what motion they want to make. So that second bullet, some broad discussion by the body with back and forth and maybe questions might be appropriate to, to sort of tease out some ideas and thoughts before somebody wants to make a motion. So it, it can happen either way. Um, I don't think it's that important, but I think you know, for, for the chair or whoever's running the meeting to maybe say at the outset of deliberation, here's what I, here's what I think we're going to do tonight and, and sort of pick a path in terms of how the deliberation is going to go, that, that can be helpful. Um, but you do not necessarily have to do it one way or another. It can work pretty effectively both ways. So that's it. Um, I know I've included some, some commentary in there, which wasn't really in the presentation, but I, I thought this was good timing after kind of what you all went through during this last application. Um, I wanted to do this after you finished that one up and got it off your plate um, so that it was kind of in the rear view mirror, but um, I'm hoping it was a, I guess, a good experience and maybe if you take some of this content it will help some of these some of these applications go a little bit smoother next time okay thank you very much Ian um, I think that at this point some of the refresher that you have done for us tonight is certainly very helpful and we will we should keep that this refresher in the backs of our mind we certainly do have in the ordinance in the criterias variables, as you said, discretionary criteria. And so the notion, the idea of a work session um, um, to hash out some of that would probably may do us some good. I think that um, Mayor Russell hit the point on the, hit, hit a very, very real point that we have not been together for a long time. And Andy, I think you hit it too that there's only two of us left on this commission from when you were an applicant, okay? I think that the more that we exchange ideas with each other, the more we get to know each other. And yeah, it's going to be painful sometimes or, or long <laughs> or take time, but I, I think it's, it's, it's a process as everything else is, as everything else is. Um, Heidi, um, 
there was, has been a request to go ahead and put together some work session to try to deal with some of our, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, now I'm at a loss of words, maybe some of our uh, different perceptions of what the commission uh, should be about. And maybe that's something that we should, we should take a look at. Okay, Heidi. Um, and can I, I invited you, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, after the last meeting, there were some questions like, um, you know, when does the alternate get to vote? And um, I know that we uh, forgot to do in January the re the reelection of the chair. But um, could you just talk a little bit about um, the alternates and and how and when they might come in place? Is it only when the a quorum is needed, and will they be able voting on the chair? Um, those kinds of things. Well, inter interesting question on the chair. So um, and. Give you a preview. I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but but as I think I said earlier, the commission this commission is interesting in that one that it has alternates. Not all of our boards or commissions do, um, and the code says alternates can take part in any deliberation. That's what the code says. Any deliberation, but may vote only as provided in elsewhere in the code, and and that's only when they're needed for a quorum. So, um, okay. like like tonight. Okay. For example, you did not need any alternates to establish a quorum, so it's clear that no alternates were going to be voting. But alternates could have participated in that in, in that deliberation. Now, I, I, again, I'd emphasize it's still up to the chair to recognize that if the practice is that has been that alternates are generally recognized by the chair and can participate. No reason not to continue that. But but it is an interesting. I mean, I will tell you that. I will just tell you, if I were, if we were establishing this committee now and I were writing the code, I wouldn't write it that way. I mean, I would say there are alternates who can participate if they're needed to establish a quorum, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have all this participating in deliberations if they weren't voting. Um, but maybe there's a reason. I mean, everybody on this commission has particular expertise and interest in historic resources. So perhaps there's an argument that having these additional viewpoints which are founded in some interest, expertise, or experience is gonna be helpful for the voting members to get to a good decision. So I can totally see that, but I think it sets up an interesting dynamic and I don't know how it typically works or whether it's been an issue, but, but yeah, it's quite clear alternates may participate in any deliberation, um, but they only vote if they're needed for a quorum. So that, that should be clear at the outset of the meeting, whether an alternate is going to be voting or not. Um, but whether they participate, yes, they can. Now, on the question of whether an alternate can participate um, in the selection of a chair or a vice chair, uh, I'm just putting this together now because I hadn't thought about it. I'm going to say no. Um, I, I don't think so. If you're reading the code sort of as plainly and literally as possible, which is sort of what we try to do unless we have a reason to do otherwise, um, I think an alternate could uh, nominate someone, they could weigh in and say this person would be a great chair or vice chair for these reasons, but unless they're participating because they're necessary for a quorum, I don't think they should be voting on that question just like they wouldn't vote on any other question. Okay, so pretty much as far as the voting for the chair goes, the same, pretty much the same procedures that we followed. Alternates do have input and they do have participation, but when they're uh, when they are not needed, an alter is not needed for a quorum. We have a quorum of um, commissioners, as tonight we have all commissioners, all the commissioners are here. Then they are excluded from the voting process. I think that makes the most sense. Yes. Okay. Are there any yeah. other clarifying questions for Ian? Ian, I just have a question. Um, I know what else came up is um, you know recusing yourself from voting. You know, it's um, every, one of all the commissioners have expertise and and backgrounds, and um, and this meeting went smoothly. Do you have any other guidance that we can you yeah, give the commissioners about that? I do. I mean, I guess quick advice is if if you see if any of you see something coming in terms of a conflict or a potential conflict, and I'll speak briefly to those. Contact Heidi ahead of time. Um, she, can, she can get me in the loop if necessary. We can try to help you make a decision ahead of time whether we think there is a conflict that might 
be an issue. Um, so you're, you're, you're welcome and encouraged to do that. Uh, sort of the baseline in land use decisions is everyone is entitled to an impartial decision and an impartial decision-making body, right? Mm -hmm. Gotta be the judge, you're neutral. Um, the judges, you have to be neutral. Every applicant is entitled to that. Every interested party, every person opposing an application is entitled to that too. So um, this is, this, there's kind of an intersection between what that means in land use and what that means in state ethics law. Um, what it means in land use is you can have opinions, you can have strong feelings about standards or applications, you know, cost, expense, time, hassle of a system. You can have all of those opinions and strong feelings. You can still be an impartial decision maker if you can say, yeah, I think this is lame and this costs too much and this is unnecessary delay, but I, I can still apply the criteria in an impartial way because I know what my job is. If you can do that, you are probably not going to get disqualified by somebody who challenges you on the basis that you are by or prejudged the application or are impartial. And put another way, it is a very high bar in land use world to disqualify a decision maker for being biased or impartial. In other words, you can have strong opinions, but if you can say, I can still apply the criteria, you're probably going to be okay, um, no matter what you have said or thought or communicated about an application in the past. So I hope that's somewhat helpful. Um, the other aspect of this is, is People think of this as uh, they sort of equate this with conflicts. And, and in Oregon, we have two types of conflicts. We have potential conflicts and actual conflicts of interest. In Oregon, to have a potential or an actual conflict under state law, it means there has to be a financial benefit somewhere in the picture for you. Um, you do not have a conflict of interest, either actual or potential, if your cousin Joe is a sheetrocker that might do work on this um, if, if the application is approved. You do not have a conflict of interest if the applicant is uh, your, um, I don't know, golfing buddy. That, that is not a conflict of interest in Oregon law. You only have a conflict if you are going to make money or, or reap some financial benefit from your decision. So, um, Hopefully that means that you will have fewer conflicts than you think you might. A lot of the time a decision maker thinks, oh gosh, I'm subject to some appearance of impropriety standard. I wanna be very careful. That's honorable, it's respectful. Um, it, is usually not, uh, it is usually not something that will force you to declare an actual or potential conflict. So when you are thinking of conflicts or potential conflicts when applications are coming at you, look for dollar signs. If it's something that might, that will or might make you money, including something like increase your property value, um, then you might have an actual or a potential conflict. If it's somebody you know, somebody you've served on a board with, somebody you worked with, somebody who's your friend, somebody who's done work on your house, probably not an actual or potential conflict and probably not enough to disqualify you as not being an impartial decision maker. So, it's good to see these things coming. It's good to, to be really diligent in trying to identify them. Um, it's good to go to Heidi when you think there's a potential issue, but I think maybe more often than not, and or the legal department are gonna say, thanks, good job, not a conflict, probably not enough to disqualify you. Um, maybe it's something you say at the outset of a hearing. You know, I know Joe, Joe and I are friends. I'm still impartial. This isn't going to affect my my review of the application. Let's move on. Um, that is something something you might do in an abundance of caution. You're usually not going to have to recuse yourself from the decision. Now, somebody can always challenge you. You know, an applicant can say, "I know that you know you officiated at Joe's wedding 20 years ago," and you're going to say, "Well, so what? I can still apply the criteria." So those things will come up, um, but. Conflicts in Oregon are less common than people sometimes think they are because they just, they depend on money. They depend on financial gain. And if that's not present, you probably don't have a conflict. Okay, thank you, Ian. Other clarifying questions for yeah. Ian? Uh, Jim, yeah. Oh, who is it? 
Jim, I think I saw your hand up. Jim, yeah, I do have one question for you regarding continuances, uh, when they are mandatory and when they are <laughs> voluntary. I know in some instances when an applicant introduces new material at a hearing, it becomes mandatory that there's a clearance or other parties have the right to, you know, it, demand basically a continuation. Yeah. Uh, I think when we continued both these hearings, uh, we were under the understanding that the applicant had to agree to the continuance mm -hmm. uh, because it was presented to the board and there were no, I guess, opponents. Yeah. Uh, actually in one of the applications, there was an opponent, but they, yeah. I don't believe they were present uh, you know, right. when we, you know, so, when so some here's of my evidence was presented. But. Yeah, here's, here's my take. If, if an applicant asks for a continuance, that's to them, right? If, if the decision maker thinks maybe we should continue this, um, you better have the applicant on board. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how it worked at the initial hearing. It sounds, yeah. yes, somewhat obviously the applicant, it came up among the Landmarks Commission maybe, and there was some discussion and then the applicant was amenable to it? Yeah, basically, I think in both instances, I suggested continuance because during the hearing, I mean, most both hearings, motions were made, discussed, none supported. Uh, you know, I made the uh, suggestion of continuance to give the applicant a chance yeah. to revise yeah. the application because otherwise yeah. it probably both would have failed. And, and, and that's opinion. and that's usually enough. Um, you know, assuming the applicant is reading the tea leaves or just listening, um, when things are sort of going in the wrong direction, and it might just take a little time and effort to to sort of course correct, they're to take the hint and be okay. Which sounds like the commission did well enough last time because it got done. Um, but. The thing about continuances is, is if an applicant is requesting it, it really needs to be before the public hearing closes. Um, that's, you know, an applicant needs to be on their toes. They really shouldn't not request it and then see how deliberations go. Because in theory, the deliberation segment after the public hearing is closed, that shouldn't involve the applicant at all. Um, all the questions should be asked at that point and answered that should really just be discussion among the commission, maybe with minor input from staff if, if it's really necessary, but the applicant's role is done. So theoretically, legally, the applicant should seek a continuance if they want one before the hearing closes. Um, it is not totally uncommon for the decision-making body to come up with it on their own and get a head nod from the applicant during deliberations, which is sort of what it roughly sounds like happened before that's that's fine i mean consensus can can do a lot okay thank you robin yeah i i'd had five questions i'll go through them very i think you've touched on all of them so i'll just go very quickly here uh on the recusing from what you said in uh and what i could tell commissions commissioner stevens did not need to recuse himself just because he was a he building did. contractor no um, he did he did have a little ex parte contact and maybe he felt for that reason he should do that. But even that, if he did not plan to bid on that contract, uh, he did not have a financial interest and wouldn't have had to recuse himself if, if he didn't want to recuse himself. But is that, Ian, is, is that, would that be a correct understanding? Uh, yeah, I think that's generally correct. I'm going to qualify that again by saying for probably the third or fourth time, I wasn't able to watch the, the initial hearing. So I don't know all of the ins and outs, but if, to put it simply, if there was no possibility of financial gain, and I'll say realistic possibility, that's not a conflict in Oregon, so under Oregon law, so it wouldn't require any kind of recusal or announcement. Now, doesn't mean that somebody can't do it. I mean, if somebody really says, you know, the appearance of, impropri of impropriety is an important <clears throat> state that I want to make sure that um, this is as clean as possible. I'm going to recuse myself, even if everyone, including the lawyers, tell me I don't really have to. They can. I mean, that is not, that is a choice that somebody can make. But this to me sounds like something in retrospect, based on what I know, maybe not something that was required to happen. Doesn't mean somebody can't do it. Um, elected officials will sometimes do that. They'll say, look, lawyers tell me I don't have a conflict that requires me to announce it, much less recuse myself. 
but in order to make sure that everyone is as comfortable as possible, I'm going to anyway, I'll come back when this is done. So we've had that happen on our city council when people wanted to, to be especially careful. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could. Yeah, go uh, ahead, Derek. Just to, just to address this, um, in reading the staff report, now that the, now that the case is closed, uh, in reading the staff report and the fact that it was stated as suggested for denial, and the fact that I had met on site and there was communication about the idea that there are no local people. And that came up quite a number of times during the February meeting and this meeting, that there are no local people who do the work that I do. That being exposed that I do it and am local is to me, it's almost implied that if you're going to have to get a second opinion, if you're going to have to look for restoration, if you're going to have to do all these things, and there is only one guy and he happens to sit on the landmarks and he happens to believe that denial was the appropriate thing because of the application, then there is a perception that there would be some sort of financial gain, the perception of financial gain. And that was my concern. And I knew that it being contentious in that it could potentially be denied, the best thing was not to be part. Right. So that the deliberations of this commission were clean and absent of my input. Yeah, and, and Derek, from my view, you did exactly the right thing. Thank you, Derek. Okay. So the, I think, the question, look, I, I have one question though, and Derek. Uh, um, Robin, did you, uh, just hang on just a second, David. Sure. Robin, did you finish oh, your Yeah, no, I, I understood what, um, you know, what Commissioner Stevens said, but it, but just to clarify with Ian, that was Commissioner Stevens's choice. He did not have to recuse right. himself from what, right. what we know. From, from what I know, that sounds correct, yes. Okay, um, we can come back. Okay, I'll run through these other ones quickly because I think you've answered, touched on most of them. Um, in, in, on the past commission, especially, we used to, for ex parte contact, we took up time at the meeting to describe, to just say we drove by or walked by the property. Uh, my understanding of that is that that's not really ex parte contact, but is that necessary? Well, so typically the declarations at the outset covering ex parte contacts will also include declarations of any site visits. Um, that is typically something or often something that's declared. I, I will tell you this, in Bend, Oregon, we've kind of all been by pretty much every site at one time or another. Um, I think it can be a little bit clunky to say, well, yeah, I happened to drive by that a couple of weeks ago when I was going to the grocery store. But technically speaking, um, and I, frankly, I don't think that's really all that material and is not fatal if somebody doesn't disclose it. But technically, that uh, declaration period for ex parte contacts and site visits should and can be used for site visits if you go anywhere with the intent of looking at it. You know, I've got this application coming up, it's at the site, I'm gonna go out of my way to swing by it on the way home. Yeah, you should probably say that during the okay. day. If it's just something you happen to see, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, and then the next one is, um, uh, Terry, for example, recused herself on this meeting, but from what you said her at the beginning, uh, because she wasn't at the last meeting, uh, she, she didn't have to, she could have participated to the extent an alternate could have, or uh, it, that was just her choice, right? I, th I think so. I mean, as I said, it's, you know, you don't want somebody participating in a continued hearing if they're not up to speed on what happened. You know, if they haven't, for example, listened to a recording or watched the video, they probably shouldn't participate. But if they have and can say they have, there's not technically a bar to them jumping in on the theory that they're as up to speed as anyone else. Okay. And then the next one, I think you, you, you touched on, and it's not really uh, code, but, uh, uh, you know, voicing opinions when test of, when questioning uh, staff or applicant, at least my opinion, and I think you were, you were, you were all saying, saying the same thing. It ought to be just stuck to clear, uh, questions, clarifying questions, and we shouldn't go off on speeches about our own opinion at, at that stage. If you have opinions on applicable criteria, deliberations are the time to share them and express them and debate them. Um, a lot, like I said, a lot of the criteria can have some subjectivity. 
there's a lot of room to interpret those. Um, that's the time for opinions. So I don't mean to say that everybody needs to be a robot or an automaton and only uh, do things by that mechanical book. If you want to bring commentary and opinions and they relate to approval criteria, go to town. That's what deliberations are for. Okay. And then I think you touched on what an alternate can do. Um, they cannot break a tie. Cannot be, uh, if you have a quorum, they can't vote. And then the last one was the, we do have to apply to uh, the code as the city code. And in this in this case, the city code had a had a gray area, you know, pr as practicable. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate the commission being willing to discuss what that means to a greater extent, so we're not as confused next time. Okay, thank you. We'll go to we'll go to David, and then we'll go to Derek. So, uh, well, <laughs> Derek, feel free because it, it 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 concerns it concerns you. So. Like as we went through this last application, right? One of the things that we kind of learned was that Derek may be the only local contractor that works on old windows, nope. right? Well, or nope. how many? How many contractors are there? I know three people in town. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Derek, and then I'll uh, I'll think of the question. I just uh, okay. As to as to one of uh, Robin's questions to Ian, Ian, you were talking about ex parte, and prior you said that again coming into if there are dollar signs. One of the things you mentioned was property value increase, mm -hmm. and would that not require then? When I lived in the old town district, I would often say I am a resident of the old town neighborhood. Yes. Um, prior to the hearing to let it be known that I have a, I have a stake in that neighborhood. Would that be something that would need come up in reviewing an application were there to be a commissioner that lived near or in a, in the district? Yeah, t typically not. I mean, this can get a little complicated, but one, there, there's something called a class exemption from conflicts. And, and what that essentially means is if, if, if the decision on an application, just keep this in land use world, will affect a whole bunch of people in the same way, including maybe one of the decision makers, it's probably not a conflict that they need to declare. That's often, you know, like, well, I'm a water rate payer. And if this application is approved, I'm going to get a discount. Well, there's 50,000 water rate payers in Bend, so who cares? It's not a conflict. Um, you know, I'm a, I live in this neighborhood and this application is in my neighborhood. Well, if it's going to affect everyone and then every, you know, all, I don't know, 75 property owners in this little neighborhood the same way, probably not something you need to declare. Now, some of these lines are indistinct. If there's an application, this isn't really a Landmarks Commission issue, but if there's an application to uh, build a how, do some development, and it's going to include a requirement that some sidewalk go in where there's no sidewalk and it's going to have to go all the way down the street and you live three houses down the street and all of a sudden you're or it's on an unpaved street and all of a sudden your street's going to be paved and this lake that was in front of your house that arguably detracted from your property value is going to be gone because you're going to have all these right-of-way improvements that might have kind of a more realistic tangible impact on your particular property in your bottom line so that might be something that you have to declare so it really, to be a conflict, it has to be something that is kind of reasonably foreseeable. There, there are things that are tangential and so, uh, so far out in the realm of theoretical possibility that they don't really rise to the level of something you need to declare. Um, it, it takes some intuition to figure out what those are, um, but it has to be at, at some point, some potential benefit is so attenuated that it becomes so, I won't say unlikely, but just so attenuated that it doesn't really rise to the level of a potential conflict. Um, sure. That makes sense. It's a little bit indistinct, I know, but not any connection is going to be a basis for a conflict. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Thank David, you. did you come up with? Uh, no, I'm sorry for the reply all, but I forgot the other question, so. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions then for Ian? Yeah, Heidi. There are five voting members and one chair. 
if we have situations where um, a motion is made and you have two of four and two against, and then the chair would vote to break the tie, but under normal circumstances, the chair would not vote on a motion, or would they? Typically, the the and I'll I'll just say the presiding officer. I mean, the the two two general rules: the presiding officer, you know, the chair, the mayor, whoever's running the meeting. They typically don't introduce motions, right? They'll invite someone else to make a motion. Typically, it doesn't mean they can't. It's really yeah. unusual. Typically, you solicit somebody else to do it, but the, the chair, the presiding officer, the mayor, chair of the planning commission of this body, whatever, should be voting um, on okay. motions. It doesn't matter if it's a tiebreaker. I mean, it can be it can be okay. unanimous five zero. The chair should be voting. Thanks for clarifying. That's all I have. Okay, David. I did think of the question, and that is when a standard is unmeetable, right? What should what should this body do? So, in the case of like so, local window contractors, we have three. Say we have four, right? We've got what two hundred plumbers, right? So it's a lot easier to get a plumber than it would might be to get a window contractor, especially if the intention if they know the intention is to just knock out the windows. And I'm just using this one as an example because it is the exact thing that just happened. So if the standard cannot be met, right? Like easily, how, how long should, how long should a, an applicant search for a window contractor or a plumber or a concrete guy, right? Before saying it's impossible. So quick, quick thoughts on that. Um, and this, this relates a little bit, at least in concept to the idea of a condition. You can't impose a condition that an applicant cannot possibly meet, right? I don't think you're talking about a condition, but but it, it's it kind of goes to your point, right? How can an applicant be required to do something they can't do? So it's important with conditions. If you are talking about standards or criteria in the code that an applicant can't meet, if it's in the code and they can't meet it because they won't, or even if you think it's not possible for them, this kind of stinks, but you got to deny the application and that applicant who is going to be pissed and maybe members of the body that had to regrettably deny the application better be telling the legislative body, council, planning commission, we have a ridiculous standard in our code that we are finding applicants cannot possibly meet. This needs to be changed. Um, but until that happens, if they can't meet it, you've got to deny the application. Okay, uh, follow-up question. So sure. last, uh, last month, uh, the second application, we had a we have a situation where the uh, garage itself is on two different property lines, right? So a side property line and the rear property line, and like all of their garages uh, in that district, the the garages are located on the property line. So now, in order to, he was willing to lower the height of an addition as long as he could expand his garage to be able to uh, uh, drive a car because the garage was 16 by 16, right? We can make a recommendation to the planning commission to make an exception or give him a variance, right? To build along that lot line. But how exactly, I made the motion that we should uh, send a letter of recommendation uh, along to the planning department, allowing him to expand the garage in those two directions on the lot line, right? Which by current code isn't allowed. Really by current code, he'd have to take the garage down and shift it five feet to the end. Right, and so, I mean, I, you know, this Landmarks Commission can kind of, rec I mean, generally recommend whatever they want. I don't think our building division is gonna issue a building permit for anybody that wants to build across a lot line. So there are options. I mean, I don't know if a property line was, an option in this case, but there, there are some, there probably are some solutions other than ignoring one of our standards regarding building over lot lines. Uh, so it wasn't Property over line. the lot line, it's just along, uh, along okay. the lot line. So, okay, not over, just along, okay. Right. Would so, be a setback so, issue. Okay, Jim. Right. Any other questions for Ian? 
None? Okay, thank you, Ian. All right, Commission, uh, agenda item number six, selection of chair and vice chair for 2021. I will open up the floor now to nominations. Yeah, well, I'll nominate if Jerry is willing to continue to serve as chair and if, if uh, <laughs> Commissioner Stevens is willing to um, continue to serve as vice chair. Do we want to go ahead and just deal with the chair first or? I would we, prefer that. To do it the chair first. Okay. So then we have one nomination for, for chair. Is there a second to that nomination? I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a, a nomination and a second. Are there any other nominations for chair? <laughs> <laughs> Please take two steps back. <laughs> uh, and you guys ever been in the service i know how this goes <laughs> all right then we will close the nominations for chair all those in favor of of <laughs> of the nominee me serving another year as which i'm more than happy to do people by the way uh please signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. okay and now we will open up the floor for nominations for vice chair. Okay, well, I'll, I made that nomination to Derek. Um, he's if he's interested, um, service vice chair. Happy. Again. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna ask to table that motion and I don't do so lightly on this one, All right? I've heard, uh, I've heard Commissioner Stevens essentially be too disrespectful to too many uh, applicants to not uh, uh, say something about this. Okay, uh, David, um, we, the nomination has not been um, um, seconded yet. Uh, when it does, if there is a second, then we can go ahead. If there is another nominee, then we can go ahead and discuss back and forth. Uh, Jim. I'll second. Derek has been nominated and, and seconded. Uh, is there any other nominations? Are there any I other nominations? Make a motion to table. Is Ian still on this? Yeah, I am. So this, this might be a good time to ask uh, Commissioner Function what he means by motion table it's it's i'm not going to open up i'm not going to open up robert's rules of order it's too late and i've got like a dozen pairs of skis to wax tonight but um uh, but sometimes it is used that motion is used uh to kind of improperly i guess to to kind of put something away uh, or delay something so I, I guess maybe it might be good for commissioner function to sort of explain what he's trying to do i mean i understand the intent you 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 expressed your concern, but what 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 do you intend to happen with that motion if it's if it's carried? Just to discuss, uh, just to discuss uh, um, that I don't believe uh, that Commissioner Stevens is appropriate uh, with applicants coming before the committee. So I think the best thing to do probably is to say your piece and and see if you can convince some of the other commissioners of that, and then and then probably yeah. the nomination. Ian, as far as I know about motions to table, there's no discussion on the motion to table. We just go right to a vote. Right, which is why he I'll, 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 uh, I'll withdraw the motion and just uh, talk talk to uh, the motion on um, the nomination. Talk to the motion on the nomination. Okay, speak to the nomination of Derek. Uh, I have not closed the floor yet to nominations for vice. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? I would um, <clears throat> put forward for others to potentially nominate um, Commissioner Figurski as vice chair. But I do not nominate being an alternate commissioner. I, you can no nominate because you're part of the discussion, yeah. correct? In that, in that case, I'd nominate uh, Commissioner Figurski. Okay. Well, that's a good Ian, question for Ian. Can, can you do that? Ian, you're still there? 
<clears throat> yes, yes, I, I missed my opportunity to have a technical issue and leave the meeting, so I'm still here. Um, so interesting question, if an alternate can't vote, can an alternate make a motion? Um, this is not addressed no, in- I didn't make a motion. Well, you, suggest, you suggested that either you nominated somebody or you suggested that somebody be nominated. So, so here, here's what I would suggest. So we have um, one person nominated. I think if another, the best thing to do is probably to vote on that nomination. And I mean, if there is a majority that is interested in approving uh, Commissioner Stevens as the vice chair, that is probably going to solve the question. So why don't, why don't you consider doing that? And then if that doesn't, if that doesn't carry, then uh, somebody else could nominate somebody else. Back to a basic procedural question. Can a, can an alternate make a motion? Uh, no. I, and again, not addressed by the rules. I mean, I think Commissioner Coughlin says he didn't make a motion, which may be, may be the case, but from an academic sense, no, if you're making a motion, you're going to be voting on the motion. And if you can't vote, I'm going to work backwards and say, if you can't vote, you shouldn't be making motions. Now, in participating in the deliberations, could an alternate suggest or try to entice somebody else into making a motion or a nomination? Sure, but they shouldn't make it themselves. Thank you. Okay, so Ian, your recommendation is to go ahead and since we have since we have a nomination and a second, uh, Commissioner Stevens for vice, technically should would should I close the floor to nominations now? I've uh, never run this. I don't know how this commission typically does it. I mean, you know, but why, you could you could do a couple of things. One, you could ask Commissioner Figursky whether he's interested in serving as a vice chair. I mean, you can run the discussion how you want to do it. Um, but really, you've got to move through things kind of one at a time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you accept other nominations, which you can do, then you're going to have to run through votes on each one of them. That, each one, right. That might, that might be a way to do it. Um, OK. Um, uh, let me let me jump that gun first, Jim. Would you be willing to be vice? Uh, I would be willing, but I have no issue with Commissioner Stevens serving in that capacity either. Okay, all right. Then let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and and, and vote on then Commissioner Stevens as vice I chair. I believe the debate okay. is the point now. Um, well, we'll need for and against. Derek, did you want to speak for? I would be happy to serve as vice chair. Um, as to David's concerns, I'd be happy to address them. Okay. And quickly, David. So in July of 2020, an applicant came before this committee, right? and you called his plans the motel sixing of windows and doors. Okay. So when the applicant called you out, first of all, no one in this commission called you out for that. But when the owner called you out, right, you offered mm -hmm. up, quote, being from New England, I tend to be a little bit more curt as your apology to him. Mm -hmm. And nowhere in the English speaking planet is that an apology. Right, you apply standards. Last month, you applied standards from the Old Town Historic District to Drake Park. One code, yeah. What? Um, how is okay? Okay. Right. So the standards, it, 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 it's subjective, right? It, it is way too subjective, and Commissioner Stevens. It is the leading cause of this, right? The subjectivity of our applicants coming through, having, so last month, imperfect example, right? We have an AIA fellow who is a commissioner in, in a landmark district, hires another architect who has done multiple projects in multiple historic districts on multiple homes. They use the standards of Drake Park 
And then subjectively, right, Commissioner Stevens and Commissioner Pregersky applied for Old Town to Drake Park. Additionally, I don't see how we go forward when, if we have a, a Commissioner Stevens as a window repair contractor and as essential leadership uh, on the committee, right? It's already a kind of quasi uh, uh, conflict of interest. But when he has the vice chair also behind him, it seems a little bit more, I guess, ominous to uh, uh, the applicants which was generally going with my line of questioning uh, this, uh, this uh, was it morning, yes, evening. So I, I just, it's, it's too problematic to have him as one of only three uh, contractors that does, does certain work coming before the board and his temperament towards, uh, towards uh, the applicants, right? Last month he talked about uh, uh, space to void on an applicant who is an AIA fellow, right? And another, uh, uh, and his architect who is uh, uh, great at doing his job, which is uh, designing projects in historic districts. So- Can't support it. In, in essence, as a project is presented to the Landmarks Commission, I shouldn't ask that of those who are credentialed. I shouldn't ask questions as to you the application. Just, no, you should submitted. ask him to, to, to really all of our questions, right? We can boil down everything to one question. Is the, uh, is the application respectful to the district? Really, that's, that's like it. That's all we got to ask. Okay. Sure. Now, if you have uh, other, uh, uh, other concerns, then you should be asking him, not making a blanket statement that you don't like space to void. No, space to void is meant to be. Ask, him why, ask him why those spaces to voids are. You, you're not a sure. mathematician. You didn't do the space to void calculation in your head. Okay, gentlemen, I think then I think it's I'll time. Go. I think it's time. To, I think it's time to vote. All those in favor of Commissioner Stevens be serving again as the vice chair of the Landmark Commission, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, um, the ayes have it. Commissioner Stevens, you have been reelected as the vice chair of the Landmarks Commission. Okay, folks. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you both for your service. Oh, thanks, Terry. Jim. Terry, just one closing comment. Uh, as a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects, mm -hmm. fellows are not, you know, infallible. Uh, no, but he hired the application that was submitted and had significant issues. The applicant, as a fellow, should have known better. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the primary driver behind that application was their car not fitting in the garage, hence the second garage and massing issues. There were significant issues with that, and I think they were properly brought to get forward. Uh, it was one of the reasons why I asked for a continuance because the applicant should have known better than to come to a hearing with a complete second and totally different alternative and expect the board to enlist a litany of conditions to correct the faults within the application that were highlighted according to code. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Heidi, I, I, do I, think, wanna, I, I do wanna make one point in, in that please. I made a motion, I made a motion to help that architect design it so that he could bring that house down, that he could get his car in a garage. And Commissioner Fergurski and Commissioner Vora voted against it, right? In order which to was, try and get that application through. Which is right, which was their right to do, to vote against it. Yeah. Um, Heidi, I think um, some of the discussion that we've had now certainly should, um, certainly in my mind, um, uh, set some agenda for an open airing outside of commission time in a work session of some of our thoughts, our backgrounds, and uh, the way we view the world and the Landmarks Commission, whichever comes first. 
So I set up a work session for next month between like five and six o'clock to. I have no problem with that at all. Terry. Thank you for calling on me. Um, you know, I, I just might add as a suggestion to that agenda um, for the work session that, um, you know, we can certainly get to know each other better, but I'd really like to see us all take out some of the subjectivity out of the conversation. You know, our job is to review applications against Ben's historic preservation code. So maybe we could walk through that code, you know, take some time if you guys haven't print it out, highlight it, you know, make sure we know what we're reviewing against. Um, but I think we really just need to do a detailed walkthrough of the code and that might help uh, remove some of the interpretation or subjectivity, um, especially related to the applicants. You know, an applicant's background or qualification has quite frankly nothing to do with the application or the historic preservation code. And that might help stay on agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Agreed. All right. Agreed. 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 Yeah. Go to the order, anyone? Then these proceedings are closed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>